Can y'all see my, my screen here? Yep. All right, very cool. All right, looks like it's four o'clock. Uh, one last session here for today in this track one. Um, this track is made possible by NC Cardinal um, with live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. We'd like to thank the rest of the conference sponsors for making this event possible. Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen, Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. We like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to post questions. The facilitators will be collecting your questions along the way and posing them at the presenters at the end of the session. And with that, we'd like to introduce the presenters for this session, uh, Taryn McKenna, Chris Sharp, and Tiffany Little, all from Georgia Pines. Uh, they'll be talking about the batch creation of student cards. With that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, as was said, we're going to be talking about um, our project that we um, took over this past year and in this year, um, batch creating student cards. Um, so first we'll talk about the goals of the project. So the primary goal of the project was to expand access for K through 12 students. So our current policies are is um, any Georgian, no matter what age, can get a card, but for juveniles, they have to come in with their parent or guardian. So, um, so there was this idea that if we could batch import students um, from their school's database, that they would just have this instant access to digital materials, as well as being able to check out physical materials at the library as well. So we would, uh, we would lower that barrier to entry um, so that students could have more access. So that was the primary goal for the project. So as most projects do, um, we started out with a pilot. Um, so for the pilot, uh, we did start out with just one library system. And with that library system, we started with one school system. So the library system that um, we did the pilot with was the Live Oak Public Libraries. Um, and the school system was the Savannah Chatham County Public School System. And those are both in Savannah here in Georgia. So just for a frame of reference of how big the, the project was, is that um, Live Oak Libraries, they have 16 libraries in their regional system. And for Savannah Chatham, there are 68 schools and over 34,000 students that were all part of this project. So um, one of the first steps that was done for the project is, which I'm going to cover in the next slide, um, is that this pilot was approved by the Pines Governing Board, which we call the Pines Executive Committee. Um, and so there was a set of policies that was agreed upon um, by the Executive Committee to, for Live Oak to try this, this pilot. So we wanted to list out the policies that governed over the pilot because those may change later as those are, uh, there are more libraries that are interested, but this is what the, the framework that we wanted to start out with. So the first thing that we started out with was that we were going to allow there to be duplicate accounts. So at first we kind of waffled if we wanted to try matching um, to existing accounts. So that, you know, when we imported these students, are we going to try and find some matching points um, so that we can connect them to um, if they already have a Pines existing account, like a juvenile account. So, but that was um, a bit of an undertaking. And so we wanted to do a little um, proof of concept before we tried taking that further step. So it was decided that we would allow duplicate, account, duplicate accounts. Um, so the students might already have a full Pines card account with full privileges. Um, but then when we did the, the batch import, they might also have another account, which is this, this uh, more limited student card account. And so that was agreed, that was okay, that they can have both. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing was that um, it was decided that an opt-out model would be taken with this rather than an opt-in. So 
the library director of Live Oak um, had previously done a similar project at a previous library. Um, and they had attempted to start doing it with an opt-in model to where they would send home papers with um, the student's parents and say, if you want to opt in to, for your child to have this card, you know, you can go ahead and return this to the library. But they had a very low um, enrollment rate doing it that way. Um, so instead, at the previous library, they had started doing it with an opt-out model and they had a, had a lot more success doing it that way. So it was decided that um, it would be do this project would be an opt out model to where um, the students data would be imported into um, Evergreen. And um, if the parents wanted to opt out before that data was imported, we just wouldn't include them. And if they later wanted to opt out that that was fine as well. But if we heard no response, then you would be you would be imported. Um, so that was the opt-out model that we went with. Um, it was also decided that um, for these student cards that not only did it give access to the uh, library system's uh, digital materials, but that they would also be able to check out physical materials from the library. So it was decided that a five item checkout um, and no, uh, no restrictions on item type or anything like that, but just five items checked out and two holds. And the number of holds was kept really low because we did not limit that to like within the system holds. Those are Pines holds. So the, the, um, the students could put a hold on anything anywhere in Pines, which would bring other library systems materials into play into this, this pilot. So the number of holds was kept low. Um, so and then it was decided that there would be no overdue fines on the card, but then there was the question of what if some of those physical materials that are checked out, what if those get lost? What if those get damaged? They never return. So what are we gonna do about those? Um, so the um, library system proposed that the parents or guardians for uh, students who checked out materials at that library system, their, their materials, the Live Oaks materials, the parent and guardians would be responsible for those. But if something that was owned by another Pines library, um, that the Live Oak, they would, they would take responsibility for paying those fees. So that was the sort of interim, um, what are we going to do about this suggestion? Because since it was a pilot, we just wanted to get it off the ground. And that was their proposal. And that was accepted by the, the executive committee of what to do with the problem of what do we do about lost and damaged items. So, so those were the, the main governing uh, policies around the project um, that would keep us in our, our, our framework and what, what we could do. So, so as far as what had to get off the ground before it could even go forward, um, the second bullet point actually probably came first, is that um, the library system is the one who put this proposal in front of the executive committee. So they had to affirmatively say, um, we would like to do this. Um, so that was the first thing, because the, because the cards um, could be used at any Pines library, theoretically, or, or it could pull in holes from any Pines library, um, then um, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Um, so because it's usable in any Pines library, it, it was a, a decision that was made by the, the membership or the, the governing board. Um, nobody's talking to me in chat, are they? Okay. <laughs> um, so after that, then, then there was a memorandum of understanding that the library and the school board, or the school system rather, they had to get together and actually hash out with lawyers and everything else because the school system um, had to have that that MOU with the library about they were going to be sending data to the library and to us. So um, they had to hash out an MOU completely independent of us about what was going to happen with the schools and the students data. So that was um, a big first stepping stone. So then beyond that, when we're actually starting to get into um, getting the project off the ground, um, 
then we had to make a decision on, well, we have this school, well, what library should that be mapped to? Um, and at first we tried just doing like a hard, like by zip code, putting them together, but that doesn't always necessarily serve those students the best. So we sent that list to the library system um, so that they could decide that this school is either closer to this school or uh, to this library, or this library would better serve this particular school. And so they decided what the home libraries were gonna be. Um, and that was just in a spreadsheet. So um, they also needed to talk to their online vendors because the way that we decided to do the barcode was that it would have just a, um, an alpha prefix because we wanted it to be different than our other barcodes. So they needed to talk to their online vendors because if they um, were uh, relying on a, like a certain barcode prefix, we didn't want the students not to be able to access those online, um, those online materials. So, so they needed to let them know that they should approve you know, any logins with that prefix as well, as well as their regular one. So as far as the coordination of the actual project, um, so the Pine staff, we primarily dealt with the data side of the project. And we also coordinated with the school technical staff and um, also obviously with the library so that everyone was appraised of what's going on. But our primary role was getting the information into Evergreen and what happens from that side of it. Now the library system, they were responsible, responsible for the MOU with the school system, all of the marketing, all of the communication, pretty much everything on the ground as far as um, it, a project that was gonna be rolled out to their patrons. So we had sort of two different um, spheres that we were both working on. So, um, so, it, it, bleh. so if you were going to pursue something like this, if you followed the model that we did, then it would be the, the library system that would be responsible for, like I said, that, that on the ground thing, um, and then tech staff doing the other side of it, so. Okay, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Chris to talk about the process. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Is that visible? Is it showing the screen? I can't really tell. Yes. I'll assume it is. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. <clears throat> so to develop this tool that we needed to use to um, import these uh, cards, we, we uh, Taryn and Tiffany and I sat down for several sessions uh, talking out the you know, thinking out the details of what sort of data do we need to store? You know, what does this need to look like? What are the things we need to take into account, uh, um, you know, to automate the creation of these cards in line with the policies and, and process that, that uh, Tiffany was just outlining. Um, so we needed something that would, because we're, we're future-proofing this, we're not just doing it for a single library, we needed something that doesn't care where the data is coming from. Um, and as I mentioned, automated. So we don't, like, the last thing we need to be doing is, you know, sitting there every day, you know, clicking on buttons, importing school data when, you know, I mean, we're running a consortium. Uh, that can easily become a full-time job. Um, so we needed this to have as little staff intervention as possible. And we really needed ways to create the account, update the account, and then in the, in the case of opt-outs, to delete the accounts. Um, and so we decided, uh, I, I decided to, to use Perl as, uh, you know, that, that would eventually, I, I, I didn't uh, pull in Evergreen Perl libraries, but I could, since that's sort of where Evergreen lives, is in Perl. Um, and we backed it with a student card database uh, schema. So on the school side, what they do is create a CSV file that we um, designate the uh, the fields for. Let me see. I'm gonna I'm gonna share a link in the chat real quick, so you'll be able to follow along. 
and see what I did, what we did. Sorry for the delay here. Nobody likes watching typing, right? Okay. Incoming on the chat box. Okay, yes, it's true that um, they pull me into meetings so people can see my dogs. Okay. So that is, the link I just sent to you is the Git uh, it's where our code lives. It's the Git uh, repository where the code is. And it's got all the documentation that I'm not going to go into. But that's, that shows like the file format and the assumptions and things like that that you can look through if you're, so, uh, if you're really interested in the gore details. And the code itself is there, including for the uh, database creation. So we take that CSV file from a secure uh, FTP or SCP uh, location that the school has provided for us. Now that, putting that burden on the school rather than um, like through email or something like that, it, 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 it's better for them to have ultimate control of that access uh, for, for privacy reasons and I'm pretty sure legal, legal reasons as well. Um, and so it, it, it has to be over a secure connection because we just, we can't afford to lose that data. That would be catastrophic. Um, and then we, it was mentioned, we, we assume that if we're getting the file, that means those students have not opted out. Although as Tiffany mentioned, a parent can choose later to opt out and then, then we can deal with that. Now on the Evergreen side, um, as I mentioned, we create the database schema. We populate that with some of the school data, including FTP credentials. Um, and the library branch that the, the school is closest to. And, you know, we, we keep a little more information in there than we actually use at this point, but we've got things like the school address and the technical contact and, and things like that, their email address. Uh, we could expose it later in an interface. That was what I had in mind, but at this point it is all, you know, direct SQL access. Um, for the, the actual process of so the script logs into each configured school systems FTP location. Now we have not put that through its spaces because we just have a single school, but theoretically that would work if we have, you know, five schools, it'll start with the first one, download any new files matching our naming convention, and then uh, process those, then move on to the next school and download the new files from that one. Um, it will then parse the CSV file, and there are ways you can do that in Perl. One of them depends on the name of the column, which is probably safer as far as making sure the right data is in the right field. But we decided, um, rather than depending on that, that, that the, the column order was a better, a better approach. Um, and then we check to see, does it have the required fields? And if it does, we test to see if the student ID already exists. If it does, we call this an update. Um, and what an update will do is it will, um, certain fields we, we preserve like uh, username and passcode, uh, password, because the, um, they can change passwords, but like anything like address or, or name or whatever gets completely overwritten with whatever the school is sending in. We, we figured that if they're sending us this, that means there's some updated data that we need to receive. That also, because we discourage staff from uh, tinkering with the accounts, that, that's another thing. Taryn will go into some of that later. Um, and if, if we don't already have it, create an, a new account in, in Evergreen with that data. Uh, we created a student card permission group, and that's how we control the number of circulations and the number of holds. Um, we also create the barcode username. So we have a three digit school code that we assign to each of the school districts. And then whatever the school ID number is that they give us. Um, and then we create, we generate just a, a default password of, you know, month and date of their birth date. So it's not a super secure password, but it does require a little bit of knowledge uh, on behalf of the student. You know, an automated script would crack it immediately, but this at least gives us some protection. Um, the uh, school name is added to the secondary ID field. Um, that's like under driver's license or whatever. This would be other, and then it would have the school name. 
Um, that's just to give us a way to record that information. And then we ask the schools to provide parent guardian information if they have it, but if it's not, if it doesn't come in, that's fine. We'll just stick the school name in as the parent guardian, since that is kind of true that the school in this case is acting in a guardian style role. Um, and then we, just for searchability uh, and, and actually reports, uh, can use this too, we add the grade level to the name keywords uh, in, the, in the account. For opt-outs, we have the files that come in for opt-out look exactly the same as an import file, but they are named with the words opt-out in the title. Um, and if the script sees it's an opt-out file, it will delete the account fully from the database. In, in Pines, we typically don't delete anybody's account. We you know, rename things, and that's to sort of keep the integrity of circulations and holds and things like that that have happened for people. In this case, because it's a privacy issue, the parent says, you know, I don't want this. I never did want this. We just, we act like it never existed and it will anonymize the certs and, you know, delete that account fully from the database. Um, the other thing we do is uh, time-wise, we set the accounts to expire of September 15th of the following school year. Uh, in Georgia, the school year begins in early August. So this gives, uh, this, this gives a little bit of a cushion between the beginning of the next school year and when we would consider the account expired uh, for a student to continue using if, if they need to. Um, and then once the account is expired, we'll delete it after a year. And that just, you know, that's an automated process as well. The idea is that the script runs nightly and uh, just checks everything. At this point, because we're still in the pilot phase, we don't quite have it there yet. Um, and we were still tinkering with the column names and stuff like that uh, pretty late in, in the process. And then of course, the pandemic happened. So, um, but I think this passes it to Taryn and I'll hand it to you. Okay, let me steal the screen back. Let's see. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to sort my windows out. Okay, um, so there were, um, I'm not muted, am I? It's hard to tell when you're already. Nope, we can hear you. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's been a long day already. Um, there are there were several uh, policy and procedure issues, um, most many of which Chris and Tiffany have already touched upon, um, that we are aware could become problematic. So we are watching those closely and um, looking at ways that we might adapt our processes and procedures uh, to accommodate um, any problems that we encounter. Um, as as Chris and Tiffany have both talked about the opt in versus opt out was a big point of contention. Um, uh, because for the pilot project, the the library system did want this to be an opt out program. Um, they'd actually tried doing a uh, mailer like a, a, a paper registration form that went home with the parents with schools and they got like four responses out of the entire school or something like that. And they weren't having a lot of luck with uh, student card drives with the schools either. Uh, they just had a really difficult time getting the parents to go through the step of signing them up. Um, even though the parents weren't necessarily against it, they weren't going out of their way to do it. So by making this an opt out program, and informing the parents that their children will be signed up unless they tell a school that they don't want their children to participate. Uh, the library and the school both expect the usage rate to be a lot higher. Not everyone is convinced that this is a responsible use of student data, um, mainly for security reasons, um, but also because it could potentially put the parents on the hook for lost and damaged items that they were not necessarily aware their children were even checking out if they weren't paying attention to the packets that went home or the um, you know, information the school is sending out. 
And the parents might also not really be aware that the public library cards provide access to a lot of different types of library materials that their school library doesn't, um, both in print and digitally, that the parent might not think is age appropriate and that might not be uh, available through a school library. So we're monitoring that. Um, so far, we haven't had any problems, but you know, at, you know, this is uh, since we don't have a lot of usage yet. It's you know, we don't have any any good data. Um, uh, Chris and Tiffany have already talked about duplicate checking, um, but this is just to reiterate that we are monitoring to see if there are any problems in the future. Um, although we don't really think it's going to cause any problems. There might be some confusion if a child comes in and has a student card and a uh, public library card that um, the child might not even be aware that they're two different accounts. Um, and so they might be confused as to what's, you know, think all their books are on one card when they're really on the other or something like that. Um, with physical cards is another issue. Um, we're not, we decided to not issue physical cards with this. Um, one just being a practical and, you know, financial reason is that we would have to create a new kind of card for this that um, we don't currently have because we use pre-printed barcodes on the cards we currently have. And in order to use the student IDs, we'd have to come up with a, a different way of creating those cards. Um, however, the, the students at the schools in the pilot program all have uh, student ID cards already that have their number on them. Um, and so, you know, we're considering that sufficient to use as their library card. Um, we may encounter schools in the future as we expand the program that do not have those ID cards. So we may have to come up with other options for those students unless the students memorize their numbers or something like that. Um, it just remains to be seen. Um, and one thing that we don't have a good solution yet is how to handle lost cards. If they're using their student ID card, what happens right now, at least with this school uh, system, is that the school just produces another card for them with the same ID number. They keep the same ID number throughout their entire um, you know, K through 12 uh, education, as long as they stay in the same school district. Um, so in, you know, in Pines, we would issue them a new number, but since we have to match on that student ID card, the way we're doing this, you know, we don't have a great way to, to handle that. You know, if somebody else finds the card or steals it, they could use that card uh, without, you know, any, um, uh, you know, without the library knowing that they're using a lost card. So we're monitoring that as well and, and trying to consider new ideas. Um, one thing that we will do differently the next time uh, we bring a school on is that, um, you know, when we batch created the card, we have an automated user, uh, new user welcome email that goes out automatically. And when that happened, the school district hadn't actually told the parents that this was going to happen. So, you know, we assumed that they had, um, that was a bad assumption to make. Um, and so the, the libraries and the schools had, or the libraries rather, had, the, had a bunch of parents calling them asking, you know, what's going on because they thought somebody had stolen their child's data. Um, so we customize the welcome email based on permission group so that the message that goes to the student cards is different and it refers them to contact their um, school rather than the library if they have questions or if they want to opt out. Um, and in the future, we'll just emphasize that the school district really needs to inform the parents ahead of time. <laughs> um, uh, Chris had mentioned to their, um, their, we don't have a way to stop staff from making changes to these accounts. And we don't also have a way to stop, to prevent staff from creating accounts with this student card permission group. Um, 
so we do run, we can run reports to see if there's any student card uh, accounts that get created at the wrong locations, you know, with a different um, library system that's not part of this pilot project or with the wrong barcode format. So we know it's not really a student card. Um, so we can ask the libraries to, um, sorry about that, that's my timer. <laughs> um, there, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so this is mainly a staff training issue. Um, staff need to know that if they, that if parents come in and say, oh, I've moved, I have a new address, they need to give that to the school and the school needs to change it in their database and then we'll get the update. Um, there are certain fields that will not get overwritten, mainly the um, fields that the student or the parents of the student can change themselves, such as the username and password and email address and things like notification um, preferences. Um, and then we don't allow the, or we don't want the barcode to be changed either because that's what we match on. Um, so um, we got really lucky with Live Oak in that it's a large school district and they have a dedicated IT, IT team that understands the data. Um, we don't expect that to be the case with all schools that we might work with in the future. Um, so we do expect that we may have to step in more or we may even have to communicate with third parties uh, or fourth parties in this case, since there's already three parties involved, um, such as, uh, you know, the county IT, um, if they're supporting the school district or uh, another vendor that's supporting the school district. Um, also, the, um, we know that there are three main um, student information system vendors that work with the public libraries in Georgia. We don't know if we get if we end up expanding this project into private schools if there are other SIS vendors or if there are any in house, um, you know, ad hoc SIS systems. So, you know, we're making the assumption that these databases will be able to export the data we need into a CSV file. But, um, you know, we, we do have to be conscious that we may have issues with that at some point if the database isn't, you know, a modern type of database that can do that sort of thing, or if they need extra technical customizations to their database to be able to do that, or if they need to pay for those exports or anything like that. Um, the time commitment for this uh, is higher than um, we really thought about in the very beginning. Of course, doing the pilot project, we all spent a lot of time on it because there were so many things to work out. But just the, t the time um, commitment of managing communications between Pines, between the library system and the school system, we're expecting to spend at least 20 hours per school system. And there are, I believe, 181 school systems in Georgia. Um, not all of them will be interested in this, um, but, you know, even if, a, a, you know, a third of them are, this is going to be a very large project. Um, so, we're currently seeking to hire a part-time employee to manage the next phase of the project, simply because we don't have the extra time um, on our own staff right now. Uh, and the next phase of the project will be uh, bringing on um, a handful of other library systems that have uh, volunteered to be our next set of guinea pigs. So I think there's uh, six or seven different library systems and the schools they're working with that want to do this next. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, we'd hoped that we would have some good usage data uh, by the time the conference came around, but uh, the COVID-19 closures happened almost immediately after we did the batch imports and they started uh, informing the parents and the students. Um, 
and also because of that there haven't been you know the the nightly or weekly updates to student data because students haven't been in school so um, hopefully in a few months we will have a lot more data you know once uh, if schools uh, open back up in the fall um, we will have gotten through a full student data batch import for the next school year's worth of data by that point we'd been hoping we'd have more usage data before we brought any other any other schools on board but um, you know unfortunately we'll probably need to bring a lot of those schools on board before school starts um, next year before we have any real data but um, so far it's working pretty smoothly um, we haven't run into any real issues yet and we're crossing our fingers that it will stay that way uh, uh, if there's anything if anyone has any questions um, or if Chris and Tiffany have anything else that they want to talk about I'm gonna um, I'll I'll underline the time commitment issue and, and a lot of it um, aside from developing the tool in the first place which you know is it's open source software that you can use if you're interested um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, or use it as an example. And there are others who are doing this. I know Jeff Godin at uh, Travis Area District Library is, is doing something similar. Um, but his use case is slightly different. Um, but really the time, the time commitment for us came from having to deal with uh, school administration, like the system administration of the schools, because we would say, okay, we need it this way. And they would hand us back a file that was almost right, but not quite right. And then we had to just do a lot of back and forths for them to tweak it. And like, and, and then they'd be off for three days or dealing with other things. And it, so like things that probably should have just taken a day took like a week and you know so so there were a lot of delays like that that are really just more they're more about communication than anything technical or process related it's just like you know <laughs> you just need the right people on the phone at the right time or something so uh but really once it's set up as long as nobody tinkers with it it should just kind of work and that's our assumption for telling our higher-ups that this is even feasible so <laughs> is that it needs to work on its own yeah, I mean, our, our hope was that it would work kind of similarly to how acquisitions pulls in FTP files, because that's just what acquisitions does. It just goes out, checks and sees if there's anything there, pulls it in. So that was kind of like, I guess, our model that we were kind of trying to work on. Um, so, but yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, underscore what Chris was saying. I mean, it was, it's more like talking to people. <laughs> like once Chris had done the the, the hard work of coding it. Um, I mean, after that, it's, you know, if the library system says, this sounds great, let's do it. But then there's all these like moving pieces that the school system doesn't necessarily know what you need and the library doesn't necessarily. So, so having like that guiding person to move it all in the direction that it needs to go with is, is really the, the biggest, I guess, part of the job of getting uh, something live with this. Once, once the, the technical um, uh, tool is there, so. I just noticed um, Jeremiah said they, they had issues with elementary schools not actually issuing the cards to the kids, that teachers kept the cards. And I, I, I suspect that's happening with some of the schools in the district, district as well. Um, since we just talked to the school's technical uh, and you know higher level administrative staff, um, we haven't talked to the actual teachers. Um, you know the library hope is is handling that level of communication with the schools, um, and that's not something we're doing. So we're not sure how that's going to work out either. Yeah, and and the other thing is the school. Ha the, the agreement has to be between the school and the library locally like our our job is facilitating that relationship as far as the technical part goes but like it's really just between them and uh, so you know while there's some parts of the communication that are necessary between me and say the school sysadmin you know it, we loop in everybody on every communication so that there's nothing said kind of 
that we, we try to discourage side chats and stuff like that because it, it, it could really mess things up. I had a question for you all when um, folks, uh, parents opt out their child, what if the child already has things checked out? Uh, we haven't hit that issue yet. I mean, uh, the script, I'm not sure what happens when you try to delete an account with things checked out. So that's, that's a growing edge that I have not fully considered. Um, Sorry. But yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would presume. <laughs> New headache. <laughs> I, well, right, right. I, you know, it's probably dumb, but I think our assumption when we talked about the possibility was, well, if they're opting out, they wouldn't be using the card. But again, that, you know, they're human beings and they'll do weird things. Yeah, I expect some parents will realize they have, they're being billed for lost items or something, and that's when they'll want to opt out. Um, but since it's so new, I mean, it really hasn't budged since February when um, uh, we loaded the files in, uh, and the, it was a few weeks after that that the schools started informing the parents. Um, we haven't, we don't even have an opt-out opt file yet, so we don't have all the procedures worked out with that. Could I share my uh, numbers from Cardinal, just so people can see kind of what this looked like when we rolled out a similar thing? That'd be great. That'd be awesome. All right. So yeah, so this is what um, this is what our circulation counts look like. We implemented uh, sometime back in uh, January of 2017, and as you can see. Um, the summer months actually ended up being months where we would see spikes in um, circulation. So summer of 2017, summer of 2018, and summer of 2019, even though these accounts were associated with the schools and you being used in class, um, we found that that was, that, that, uh, um, that we saw a fair amount of action, action or access or whatever um, during the summertime. Benjamin, are uh, your schools, uh, are the cards for your schools um, giving full checkout permissions or are they limited any, in any way like ours are? Uh, the vast majority allow 10 circulations, no fines. We have one library system that chose to do um, no actual circulation, um, just electronic resources. And um, there's one more wrinkle. Um, it's uh, books and audio books only. Yes, no and no resource share. Um, yeah. So you can't get something from another library system. So that way, not every, we have, I think like 18 of 33 or no, now to like 40 library systems participating. And so since it's kind of the, the, the local library system is taking on um, the risk of these non-parent sanctioned accounts, whatever you want to call it, then we don't allow them to grab books from the library systems. Yeah, we, we, we had that same conversation and the, um, the consortium leadership, the executive committee, okayed it. They said, fine, because it's such a low number of, of items that can be taken out that they were, they were willing to, to do it because I think a lot of them want to do this themselves and they just wanted to see it work. It's really been cool to see it, you know, it's exciting when, when, you, when it all rolls out and really kicks off. <laughs> well, that, that was what I was about to say. It's, it's really a, another huge downside of the pandemic is that we aren't able to see how this would really work in a normal summer or, or school year. Because, um, you know, we, just, we went live and then boom, this happened. So, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of, it's all paused right now until we really know until we really can see the uh, circulation activity in a real year. Yeah, and we also um, don't have access to any statistics for digital usage. Um, all of those contracts are handled by the, school, by the libraries um, and they don't go through Pines. So even though they're um, authenticating against us, we don't have no um, access to any 
you know, check out statistics or anything. One of the things we were able to do with that, which you may find useful, is you can look at the table of SIP authentications and link that to the user type. So that at least gives you a session, even if it doesn't give you individual resources. So we found that to be a, a, a number that we, you know, these student access accounts are being used for electronic resources. Here's the number of um, unique authentication sessions that they've, you know, done. That's a good idea. I was just, um, I just saw Blake comment in, in chat um, that looks like Primes, Mobius, and CWMARS have all done something similar. Um, for Mobius or CWMARS, do y'all have your code out there anywhere? Because I'd be interested in like what you guys are doing differently than we are, if maybe we can tweak ours. So if, if you have yours anywhere, I'd be interested. Hooray for open source software. <laughs> Rock on. Okay. I'm seeing the question, the SIP data came from the permission group. It is, I'd have to look up the query, um, but what we did is we, there is a table um, that uh, tells you where when those things happen. Actually, let me just go look it up. I can probably do that quicker than trying to explain. <laughs> the, um, Diane, the students go into a specific uh, group called school, and that includes the students and the teachers. Are you thinking of patron activity, Benjamin? Yes. Okay, yeah, that that's stored separately and there are different types of activity and a SIP login is a type of activity. That's it. Type of activity. Yep. And just to just so I don't get outdone by Chris's puppies, I'm gonna share a picture of the <laughs> dog that <laughs> that we're hoping to adopt on Thursday. <laughs> so cute. Oh how adorable. <laughs> <laughs> we're so excited. Yes, I was also distracted by the dog wrestling, but. <laughs> yeah, well, so was I. I had a hard time. Um, it was fun. <laughs> I was like, oh God, why guys? And I'm, I'm a parent to now teenagers and I feel like we have toddlers again with these dogs sometimes, so. Anyway. Okay, so Michelle is going to uh, develop a new feature, it sounds like. <laughs> I don't know how that helpful how helpful that is, but that's the query that I use. Um, it's yes, it's using user activity, linking it to user, um, looking for a certain event type, and then the profile of the account. Perfect. Okay, we're getting short on um, time. Does anybody else have anything? Uh, Actually, I guess we're the last one of the day, so we don't have to end, do we? <laughs> we just for hours. <laughs> so just gra grab a drink. Get it directly into happy hour. <laughs> be, be into the, yeah. We'll we just don't add, know what's in this cup. Hoc one. <laughs> just make it an all-nighter, guys. <laughs> Maybe we can develop some new software while we're out here. Oh, cool. Jennifer posted that there are some specs out there. Perfect. Huh. So have we figured out whether Blake is a spy or not? <laughs> it's always a likely possibility. Blake's always a spy. 
it's always a spy whether he's playing resistance or not. Yeah. I like in a way we're all spies. Because <laughs> we all go peek at everybody's code. So. That's true too. <laughs> oh yes, Michelle, this is my this is my pride and joy. <laughs> My pink gooseberry. <laughs> I may have had a really long day, and I'm getting a little bit loopy. We, I think we are. Um, so that's that's always a sign like, that it's probably time to let everybody go. Okay. Thanks. All right. Hi, yeah, thanks for joining more. us.